So let's move uh, straight to Romanticism, which is not so bad, because actually, um, one of the things I want to do is actually uh, compare the Romantic period and the main features of Romantic literature with those of the Augustan period. So it's actually pretty useful for you uh, that we've just finished talking about the Augustan period because then we can immediately compare it to Romanticism. Um, okay, so here there is nothing new or not so much new for you. We've actually discussed this, that in the Augustan period, reason, intellect, and um, rational considerations are the, the, the way knowledge is presented. And uh, people in the Enlightenment period and intellectuals in the, in the, in the uh, period are focused on society, civilization, and what is possible to be known. They try to understand the world. And in their texts, they focus on convention, tradition, poeticness or poeticality, and balance and symmetry. Even if they do it with the exact intention sometimes to make fun of it, to comment on it critically, to be metatextual about it, still they directly care about these things. Now, Romanticism is doing the opposite in many of these things. Instead of saying, we can know the world through rational understanding, through reason, through logic, through empiricism, they are claiming the opposite. No, no, feelings. We cannot understand the world and we shouldn't understand the world. We have to feel the world. We have to feel uh, all of this. This is the only way you can truly understand what is happening. If you feel it and you use your intuition and your heart, not your head. Um, also, the Romantic uh, writers grew very tired of all of those political, public, social topics that the Augustans were always writing about, and they said, society is hopeless. Yes, the, the Augustans were right in their criticism of society. Society is problematic, but it cannot be reformed. They were wrong. It's completely rotten. There is no point dealing with society. Society as a whole is going to ruins. The only thing we can do is leave society behind, either physically, so like really move to the countryside, or uh, if not physically, at least stop focusing on all of those things around you and just focus on what's happening inside you. So focus rather on the individual. And actually, an example of this would be that they really got obsessed with one of these two, or both sometimes, the countryside or the wilderness. They said both that an artist should not write about cities and public life, but rather describe or paint or show either the countryside or the wilderness, or in fact, even move there himself and, um, and focus on that. And that, you know, if you remember, we mentioned that in the Renaissance, we still had uh, this double way to knowing the world. The Renaissance thinker still said that you can use your rational deduction and empirical observation to find out what is the world like, or if you want, you can try to gain a mystical understanding of the world. These two were both possible for the Renaissance, but no longer for the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment said, we don't care about mysticism. We don't care about uh, magic. We don't care about anything like that. That is just illusion. That's not how we can learn the world. And these guys do the opposite. They say, what we care about is what 
cannot be known, what is mystical, which, what is hidden, what is dark, that's what we are interested in. So in a way, if you want, the Renaissance was a balanced period where the whole type of, the whole existence was possible to do and all kinds of inquiry was accepted. Then the Enlightenment got rid of half of it and then Romanticism in reaction to the Enlightenment got rid of the other half of it and brought back that half. So in a way, uh, compared to the Renaissance, both the Enlightenment and the Romanticism are extremes. Just the opposite extremes. Um, and they don't want to understand the world, they want to experience the world. And instead of looking for balance and symmetry, they are looking for dynamism, movement, ebb and flow. And in terms of the language, they don't care about conventions, but how the language is actually used. Um, and instead of what is typically and traditionally considered poetic, they focus on what is everyday. Um, so if we go back one slide, this is basically saying the same in a way without putting it in direct contrast, this versus this. Um, it does revolt against the norm of enlightenment, it is against rationalization, it puts emotions on the uh, main spot. And what we haven't mentioned though, is that it elevates folk art. So the Romantic period, um, possibly for the first time, um, instead of focusing on the big written tradition, reaching back to either uh, ancient Rome and ancient Greek or the medieval Christian tradition. So it actually, it doesn't ignore those two traditions, but it discovers that there is not only the written church tradition of the Middle Ages and the written Greek and Roman traditions, which are mostly pagan, but also there is an unwritten, uh, an oral literary tradition as well, which is spread still from generation to generation and still created in the period in many cases, and also that the same goes for painting, that there is actually, and, and sculpture, uh, that there is actually, um, and other visual, uh, like dresses, for example. We don't actually have those things that the people in the countryside are doing. So they got interested in that. Um, it's a different story how. You shouldn't imagine it like the late 19th, early 20th century, um, ethnographical movement when the researchers would go and visit the, uh, the villages and take uh, photos or draw or take their little um, gramophones and record the people actually singing the folk songs. So it's not like that. It's more like since the romantic poets are already in the countryside and the peasants are also in the countryside, so let's look at them from a distance and be uh, inspired by what they say, or let's sometimes talk to them, but then still make it better, uh, because they are interesting, but still, we are the poets, they are not. So this is still, in a way, a very much um, interested, but from uh, a position looking somewhat down still. So interested, but still imagining that they are doing it better. Um, the medieval times are becoming a central point of interest for them, which is important because obviously for the Renaissance, it was the ancient Greeks and Romans, and for the Enlightenment, it was still the ancient Greeks and Romans. And so this is the first period when they sort of look back on the medieval times, but then again, careful, not the actual Middle Ages, but the mythical Middle Ages. So these are guys are interested in King Arthur and uh, knights and uh, all those fairy tale, legendary medieval things and not 
the actual medieval uh, things. That would more, that would start to appear first on a relatively scientific and systematic level in the 19th century after these guys. So the Victorians would already start uh, researching the Middle Ages, and although there is romanticization of the Middle Ages even in the 19th century, but there is much more actual research behind that, and this is getting much, much closer to uh, something systematic and less fairy tale like than here. Um, in fact, not only do they the individual, but their idol is the heroic individual, an individual who follows his heart, usually his, and not her, his heart to the extent that they are going to do whatever is right, whether it makes sense or not. So the individual who does something stupid but heroic in a way, if you want. The more heroic, the less it matters that it's stupid. Um, Yes, and the French Revolution is going to be a strong influence on Romanticism, mostly outside Britain. So Romanticism, if you remember what you learned and heard about it, um, then you often hear about how Romanticism actually coincides with nationalism and coincides with the big revolutions. That is true in Central Europe. So that would be true for Czech Republic, I mean, Czechos Czech Republic, Slovakia, or Czechoslovakia rather, um, or Czech lands in fact, that period, uh, which is even a part of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, and before that the Habsburg monarchy anyway. So our part of the world, yes, Poland, yes, Hungary, yes, Austria, yes, a lot of those period places, yes. But in Britain, the, in uh, the Romanticism is no longer like the Renaissance, that it's 200 years or 100, 100 to 200 years after the Italian Renaissance. British Romanticism is amongst the first Romanticisms. So here, it actually doesn't follow the French Revolution, but coincides with the French Revolution. So when uh, British Romanticism happens, the French and other national Roma uh, and some other revolutions, the Italian, etc., are happening. But whereas the French and others are doing their own revolutions, the Brits are happy on their island and happy in their countryside and their wilderness and mostly don't care about revolutions at all. So this is a special feature of British Romanticism that it is not um, political. The French, Italian, etc. are political and revolutionary because those revolutions are happening. The Central and Eastern Europeans though come later, but are influenced by the earlier revolutions. These guys coincide, but they are happy up there in the north and the island, with one exception. And we are going to talk about that one exception soon. Okay, so, basically, if we want to talk about the definitive manifesto of British Romanticism, the programming text, the text that gives Romanticism is mission, then if we want to be really, really, really correct, we have to say there is no such thing. British Romantic authors didn't really have a kind of manifesto that would inspire them to write their own um, new way of working. However, there is something which can be considered as something almost like a manifesto, and that is verse-verse preface to the lyrical ballads. So here is the other way around, like uh, in some 18th and 19th century work, you would have it like that, that first some people get together, write down what they want to do, and then they do it. These guys didn't do it like that. They first wrote 
a book of poetry. Verse, Verse and Coleridge wrote a book of poetry together. Um, and it was successful, so much successful that two years later, uh, they need to publish a second edition. So for the second edition, they decided that it's high time to explain what we are trying to do here. So in fact, they created the program in retrospect explaining what just happened. But from our 21st century perspective, it's good enough to be considered a manifesto um, and the theoretical foundation. So, um, yeah, we've actually talked about these things, that they are not participating in revolution and in fact are also partially against revolution and they are less radical than many other uh, romanticisms. Okay, so what are the central claims of the preface to the lyrical ballad. Um, choose incidents and situations from common life. Try to use language really used by men. Focus on ordinary things, but show the ordinary things in an unusual aspect. So it's not like realism, which is trying to show ordinary life in all of its ordinariness. It's like, find something absolutely every day and show how it is special and unusual. Um, if you now think about how often when we describe various books, we say it is romanticized. That's why, you know, <laughs> show, show something usually in an unusual light, make it big and, and special and emotional and so on. This is interesting. Humble life and rustic life was generally chosen. This is again a revelatory phrase, like rustic life, what verse verse means here is simply life in the countryside. But these days, if we use the word rustic, we don't just mean uh, something related to the countryside. These days we mean something which is related to the countryside, but sort of over dramatic and over uh, idolized and so on. And this is also because of what the Romantics did. So they showed it, but in a very idealized manner. And all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. This is where this whole idea that, you know, poets are supposed to just, and writers, just supposed to sit at their desk with their notebook, look into the distance, and then once the inspiration comes, strikes them, they lose their, uh, and then like, bang, there goes the novel. So this kind of very um, unrealistic and irrealistic expectation is that somehow all of writing is really just about inspiration and talent and, and either you have it or you don't have it and you should just let your juices flow and then that becomes the poetry. That's something of course which strongly is rooted to Romanticism. So. This is not what, for example, the um, Enlightenment writers would say at all. For them, you are a poet because you want to write a sonnet, so you look at how the best sonneteers wrote it, you learn consciously the form of the sonnet, and you work and work and work until you get amazing. By conscious work. Whereas here is no, no, no. You either have it or you don't have it, and it just happens. Um, whether it's actually true is a question, like if you actually read their um, notes, uh, notebooks, and, and then you find out that they actually pretty consciously worked on that and, and really had several versions and etc. etc. But they were at least able to not only convince people that this is how they wrote, but in fact sort of in a way make a lasting influence and sort of 
um, ruining the life of writers ever since, because to some extent all writers struggle with this. You know, that like, if I'm really right, then it has to somehow come from inside, even if they work systematically. It's like this very idea that you can have the God-given God gift of the this magical touch, and that if it doesn't work, it's not because you should do some research and read and visit places, but just have to sit there and struggle until something happens. This is, of course, the negative influence of the Romantics. So, um, maybe it's not too visible because of too much light, but anyway. Uh, um, I'm going to show you some paintings first, because I think it shows very well how the uh, Romantic um, movement imagines the countryside and anyway, not just the countryside, but art as such. Uh, it's visible immediately and you don't have to read the text to sort of see it. So, um, basically I'm going to show you two models of uh, two visual models well represented by two different um, painters. One of them is Turner, who usually painted pictures like this. Dark, light, big contrast, uh, colors mostly white, yellow and red, lots of uh, dynamism and movement and lots of drama. So, by the way, also, this is a city which is riddled by plague and death and is burning and there is a storm destroying the city. So it doesn't only show the dynamism and the contrast, but also the topic. As I said, they don't care about the city, but if they do, only like this, showing it getting ruined. Let's see, the other picture is more visible. The burning of the Houses of Parliament. See, it is not a countryside, it is the city, but what does it show? It shows the very symbol of civilization, society and politics burning down. And also, okay, true, the Parliament, the Houses of Parliament in um, Westminster are actually um, next to the water, it's true, the River Thames is there, so if you go there you see it. But look here, it looks like a tiny little thing in this almost sea-like water. This is not how it looks, right? So the natural element, water, and also obviously, if this is the height of the buildings of Parliament, the fire is not going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times bigger than the building. That's obviously not how it works. What he shows is how it feels and not how it really looks like. Is the emo it's true, the picture is not a lie, but it's emotionally true. When you are there, it's like the lyrics of Smoke on the Water. It's exactly the same thing. Smoke on the water, fire in the sky. Uh, just visually. And again, both of them are exaggerating, obviously. <laughs> but if you are there and you see some huge building burning down, uh, in the case of Deep Purple, the hot where they were staying, um, then that's sort of dramatical and this is how you imagine it. But then again, you can see water versus fire, lots of movement and dynamism, um, not too much detail. So it shows a lot how this kind of subjective inner view works. Okay, now let's see the other main romantic painter of Britain, John Constable. It's very different, right? Again, we have the countryside, but what do we have here? We have here 
working. But how? Like, take a look at it. Um, and here another one. First of all, they, compared to this whole scene, are relatively unimportant, even if one of them is in the front. They are much smaller than the countryside as such. Second, they have this cute little doggy here. They are working, but, you know, it's not the kind of realist painting of agricultural work, where they are sweating and toiling and, 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 and uh, tired and dirty. These all have, like, pretty nice little clothes. They are not overworked. They are sort of enjoying it because for the romantic movement, this is the ideal. We should all be peasants. Um, it is really over-idealized. Uh, even more, if you look at the other painting, again, like little horsey, and the work is done in a way that you have one boy and another boy, and actually pulling a boat is just child's work. It's like the Garden of Eden on Earth, just in the English countryside. So obviously, again, this is not realistic in the objective sense, but differently than the other one. If one of them was this kind of dramatic overemphasis of contrast, here there are no contrasts, it's just uh, an over-fetishization of a non-existing countryside. I mean, existing in the sense that you know where it exactly is, but this scene in this way obviously couldn't have happened. Um, and I think now we have a little break, so five minutes. So let's try to talk a little bit about literature as well. And um, so I've already mentioned, of course, Versworth and Coleridge, who um, are two of the biggest names in the period. Um, but you might have heard also about the Lake Poets. Uh, the Lake Poets are Lake Poets because they move to the lakes, the Lake District. And um, the original three Lake Poets are Wordsworth, Coleridge and Southey. Um, Southey is not as well known, obviously, as um, these two, but these are the first generation. And um, of course, the others also then um, join them, but they are a bit younger. With the exception of Blake, who is, even, who is not a member of the original Blake poets, because he's even older than them. Um, and my favorite is Blake, so let's talk a bit about Blake. Um, he is, and the main reason I think I like him, is just because he is not like the others. He is, I think, somewhat unusual, somewhat special, somewhat different from them. Like, for example, that in a lot of cases, in fact in most cases, he didn't just publish poetry, but he published books where he combined poetry with visual art, with beautiful drawings and, and, and colorful illustrations, and not just, and this is the important point, in a lot of cases, not even really illustrations. Because in fact, as I'm going to soon give you a few examples, you should not from each other, because the paint, the, illust the, the, the drawing, the visual image, modifies the meaning of the text, or the other way around. So the two of them separately just don't really say the whole thing. And then let's think about how you have come across anything written by Blake these days. Just the text without anything. So well done, well done anthologies. You are just getting rid of at least half of the message. Um, anyway, now mysticism is something that absolutely well qualifies with the Romanticism. They love mystical themes. Um, but the very strong biblicality is something that 
um, that is not necessarily like all the other romantic authors. And also, however, it's interesting because strongly influenced by the Bible, but completely against established religion. So yes, he has angels and biblical topics and, and hell and heaven and all that, but not necessarily in a way that they would be happy to show them in a church because it's often breaking established dogmas. Um, and also, this whole religious theme is mixed with, with mysticism and almost magical kind of thinking. So, he is actually closer to New Age than 19th, 18th and 19th century religion. Uh, but obviously, New Age came much later. So, they really started to appreciate <laughs> some of his stuff in that period, I think, more than in his own contemporary period. To them. Um, that, for example, look at this quote, humanity can overcome the limitations of its five senses if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Now, the doors, the band, was named, inspired by this quote. Also, the book, The Doors of Perception, by, what's his name? Uh, I don't remember now. The, Timothy Leary uh, is named after this quote. That, have you heard of Leary? Um, a psychologist who investigated the use of LSD um, and systematically described trips drug-induced trips and so on. So those guys are the ones who reach back to Blake. Uh, so this New Age thing is not forced at all. The New Age guys really uh, got very much inspired by him. Uh, okay, so let's see a few things. Like, for example, when I mention that like dividing the picture from the text is a bit stupid, then you can see it here. Songs of Innocence, the songs is actually part of the branches and the leaves of the tree. Uh, but also, oh by the way, he did his own uh, drawings. It's actually a bit more complex than that, because okay, you can see tree, woman, possibly her daughter, they are reading something, yeah, whatever. But look closer. It's unfortunately not a high quality representation. What does this man, little man, do here looking up at the sky like this? What is this other figure? Uh, this is a bird. This one is actually playing a flute or some kind of musical instrument. And there are all kinds of hidden little figures doing weird stuff at places you wouldn't expect them to be. And there is, for example, a page or two pages from the same uh, same book. Now this is more like a typical just illustration of the text, but still I think it's quite fascinating and interesting as a whole. So why separate these things from each other? Okay, but he also did actual illustrations uh, to other people's texts, like for example to Dante's Inferno, here is Dante and Virgil at the gates of hell, or a part of hell, the whirlwind of lovers. If you remember my t-shirt from the first lesson, which I don't wear today, unfortunately, there are all those layers in Dante's hell, and every type of sin has its own place. You know, depending on the seriousness of hell, you can be relatively at the top or extremely down below. And what is described in the text is also that each and every usually somehow related to their sin. And those who sin is that they are lovers. I mean, being lovers is not a sin, right? If you, if you love your husband or wife. But if you love somebody else, or if you just love somebody without marrying the person, or if it's the same sex, 
or blah, 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 blah. If you do specific sexual practices which are not accepted by the medieval church, then that is all a sin, and all of those have their own place in hell. And they are supposed to um, go around in an eternal whirlwind around and around and never stop. But his way of imagining it is pretty graphic, I would say. You know, these are all uh, naked people, etc. And I, I, I think this is almost um, almost modernist, in fact. Um, this is also, like, there is this figure whom I don't know who he is, but like, instead of his head, we have this, like, big white light, which is Probably, if you really want to make, take it in a realistic level, it's just uh, the top of hell, that where you can see the light coming in from the outside, but this coincidence of the head and the light and not seeing the head is probably a bit more um, psychedelic than just, you know, the light coming in. Um, yeah, by the way, um, Blake was truly a genius, I think, both as a poet and as a, uh, an illustrator and in fact the two together, but by the way he did talk to angels. I mean, at least that's what he thought. So <laughs> if he is trippy then that's because he didn't need to take drugs for that. Okay, so let's talk about another unusual one. George Gordon Lord Byron usually just referred to as Byron, um, who is the exception from the British Romantists in terms of active political career. This guy did have an active political career. He actually uh, joined uh, various revolutionary movements in both Italy and Greece, where they love him still. So he's a national hero both in Greece and in Italy. So in Italy you can go to all kinds of touristy towns and find, find signs and statues and all kinds of things commemorating Byron. Um, but the main reason Byron is so important in a literary sense, not in a, uh, in a historical sense, is that he gave literature the Byronic hero. The Byronic hero is something that appears in Western literature all over the place. So he did it first, but he inspired writers throughout Europe so much that you can find poetic works it's Byronic heroes all over the place. Now, the Byronic hero is somebody extremely talented, very passionate, against society, against rank and privilege and hierarchy, is a rebel, is in exile, but while, although he does things with passion and usually things for the common good, so he's a sort of good, dynamic, crazy character, but at the same time they always have a tendency to destruct themselves, so they either die or at least do all their best to ruin their own health. Um, and they are always dissatisfied, like unhappy in love. And there is something hidden, not completely okay in their past. We often don't find out what it is, but we know that something is not a hundred percent okay in their past. But it's just in the past. It's sort of haunting them a bit, but usually didn't really catch them. Um, yes, and in fact, he wrote two long um, epic poems with Byronic heroes in them, Don Juan, um, which is, guess what, um, this is about, um, and um, Child Herald's Pilgrimage, which is partially um, 
autobiographical. But by the way, this whole character of the Byronic hero is pretty much uh, autobiographically inspired. Like Byron, as an actual person, was quite like his own heroes. So he was somebody who was very passionate, uh, very much a rebel. Um, this is why, like the reason he joins all of those um, revolutions in those countries is because he's just so dissatisfied with Britain and with British uh, life and also with his own romantic Co like writers, like contemporary writers, who were basically his friend, but they still, he still thought they are like, eh, just, you know, writing stuff at the lake, like, I understand that they are not happy with the world, I'm not either, but then go and do something about it. Um, so, he himself was also a rebel, he himself lived mostly outside Britain, um, and he was self-destructive, he usually was unsatisfied with, in love, not bodily speaking. He had a lot of lovers, and not just women, and allegedly not just men either. So, tried everything, kind of. Um, I don't mean children, not those. I meant animals. Um, but anyway, we never know if it's true or it's just allegations. Um, okay, so fun guy also. And now let's notice that here I crossed out romanticism. The last person I want to talk about is not a romantic author at all, which is which sucks, because he, she was a direct contemporary of the Romantics, so she wrote exactly in the same period as the Romantic writers. And to make it even more confusing, her stories, of course, are about relationships and love, and that sort of coincides with the non-academic uh, <laughs> idea of what somebody imagines when you hear the word romantic and romance. Uh, but have you read anything by Jane Austen? Anybody? Was it like, you know, romantic literature? No. no, and that's exactly the point. So yes, he writes about relationships. Yes, he writes, she, she, sorry. Yes, she writes about re relationships. Yes, she writes about love and courtship and all of these things, but not like in a romantic uh, story, um, not cheap flick at all. Um, in fact, um, her stories are often showing this, um, these two dichotomies, these two opposites in their stories that you would have the main dilemma, choosing between passionate emotion or um, moderate behavior, and also choosing between moderate behavior and calculation. So basically, in the world of Jane Austen, you usually have um, some girl not necessarily the main character, some girl who would really, really like to be really tempted by passionate emotion. There is, there is this option to, to just follow your emotions and just live the moment. This is what the romantic writers and poets would also claim. Then you usually have the family. And the family is the opposite extreme. Uh, those are the ones who are talking about my little daughter, you should marry this guy because we have a small land and he's got a big land and if the two of you married then uh, our family's lands would be much bigger and it would be good and blah 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 blah. Uh, so this is one extreme, the lose your head and just marry the first sexy guy is the other op opposite of course, but 
Austen is not a romantic writer, so she won't have the character choosing either of the extremes. So no marriage out of calculation, but also no marriage out of losing your head. Something in between. Moderation. Yes, there should be attraction and love, but it shouldn't be completely uh, unadvantageous either. So, um, but all of this is shown with immense irony, and irony with everybody. So, the portrayal of everybody, including protagonist is ironic. So it's not like making fun of some specific people, but really ironical about everything. And are usually considered comedies of uh, manner. And if you're saying, hmm, that's interesting. Are these novels about families and strategies of marriage and and it's full of irony and satire. That reminds me of something. What does that remind you of? Which period? Takamo. Don't be afraid. Just tell me. The one that we talked about before, right? Which is the Augustan period, right? And this is exactly the thing. The reason Austin is not like the others, because while she is a contemporary of the Romantics, but she is actually a representative of the earlier period, a late representative, which is good. Like if she was writing about those same topics in the way that Byron would have just, you know, in this domestic setting, it would actually just turn into some cheap romantic thing, and then maybe we wouldn't even be reading her now, because like, there are so many other writers writing in that way, there would be no point. But she's exactly special and exactly more and exactly much more interesting because of all of these things and many others. Also, her attention to detailed, refined portrayal of character, um, her very okay centric, but still very special, typically Austenian sense of humor, for example. Which not everybody likes, that's true, but in any case, um, is certainly very um, special. And also, she is one of the most frequently adapted British authors in terms of film adaptations and TV series adaptations and so on. Not the most frequently adapted, that is Shakespeare. But she comes a close second to that. It's another question whether those adaptations are good. Um, because, you know, if you have the topic of love and marriage the tempta and your Hollywood, then the temptation is big to make it much more romantic and much more syrupy and then Austin would be happy to see. But anyway, the stories are definitely there and they are attractive uh, for directors. Okay. So we are going to stop here. Thanks for coming. See you next week. Bye-bye.